Hi, good morning. My name is Otis Toussaint, and I'm coming to you live from the AUSA Virtual Conference. Uh, this year, we are doing it virtually. We're all one of these in virtual because of the new reality that we're in. We're in a COVID-19 uh, reality. So, but today I'd like to talk about medical readiness. Medical readiness, one of the foremost things in Army medicine. Uh, and I've got a panel today of three decorated officers that will be giving, me, giving you all the information today regarding uh, medical readiness. And I'd like to introduce my entire panel right now. Hi team, how are you all doing? Good morning to everybody. Good morning to you. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like I'd like to have everyone go ahead and just introduce themselves uh, to the actual uh, viewers that we have. We have it looks like almost 20 viewers right now on our live discussion. So go ahead. We can start from the top with uh, Colonel Stevens. Uh, good morning and well wishes to all. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Yolanda Stevens, currently serving at OTSG uh, G37 Medical Readiness as the Chief of Policy and Training. Um, that's about it. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning to you. Next, we will have uh, Colonel Andreas. Hey, good morning, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gardner Andreas. Um, I'm also uh, part of G37 Medical Readiness. I'm the Operations uh, Branch Chief. Okay. Thank you very much, Colonel Andreas. And last but not least, Colonel Dentiman. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Colonel Jay Dentiman, uh, the Chief of G37 uh, Medical Readiness and Office of the Surgeon General. Uh, I'm a uh, medical corps officer. I'm a, um, a neonatologist, which is a, a physician for, for premature babies. Um, and I uh, just started the position uh, a couple months ago, um, but I'm thrilled to be here and, and also super excited to be backed up by such strong team members and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens and Lieutenant Colonel uh, Andreas as well. So pleased to be here this morning. Awesome, awesome. Good morning. And so I really appreciate you all joining us on this panel this morning. The uh, Surgeon General of the Army, General Dingle, also appreciates everyone taking the time this morning to come and actually talk about medical readiness uh, for our viewers today. But before we go into the slides, I'd like to have, you know, when the word, when the terminology medical readiness uh, is presented to you, I'd like to have this, the, the panel go around. Just tell us in a quick, brief manner, a 15, 30 second definition, what exactly medical readiness means to you. Uh, Ma'am, if you could go first. Uh, what medical readiness means to me is um, being ready um, uh, to serve wherever uh, is needed medically. Okay, thank you. And Carl Dinsman, what about you? Uh, so I'd echo those sentiments. Um, you know, individual medical readiness is uh, uh, um, uh, fundamentally uh, a responsibility of the individual soldier, um, and it it basically means that um, that you, as the individual soldier, uh, maintain your medical readiness so that at a moment's notice, um, if called upon, um, you can be deployable uh, to austere environments um, to to fight or function in whatever your MOS is. And so um, uh, it, it fundamentally is kind of one of those basic soldiering tasks that needs to be maintained uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, uh, because if it's not, if it's not, if an individual is not medically ready, um, then there is a, a decent chance that they may not be actually able to deploy. Uh, and the, the commanders, our country is counting on every service member being uh, ready to deploy at a moment's notice. And while readiness doesn't equal deployability, um, there is a, a, a definite connection there where uh, our individuals or soldiers who are not medically ready um, many, many times or many cases may not be medically, may not be deployable as well. Okay, so medical readiness essentially affects the fighting force strength overall for all of our military organizations. And um, Colonel Andreas, if you can give me just an additional, at, at, an addition to your predecessors, what they've said. Yeah, so um, the most important thing that uh, Colonel Dentman said there was austere environment. Uh, so when we deploy our soldiers, we only deploy them to austere environments. We don't typically deploy them to Disneyland or somewhere nice. Um, so individual medical readiness means that the soldier needs to be uh, fit and able to go into an austere environment where they may not have um, you know, a, a great amount of um, medical capability to provide them um, 
ongoing care. So they got to be strong and fit and ready to be in that environment for an enduring period of time uh, and be able to do their mission uh, with strength and endurance. Um, so that's one of the key things of medical readiness is uh, looking at soldiers continually to make sure that they're, they're constantly staying fit. So like Colonel Dintman said, at a moment's notice, they can go um, and, and be there for uh, a period of time without needing uh, access to medical care. Okay. Well, thank you. Very I'm going to jump right back in here because there's ahead, another sir. job I wanted to just address. You know, we know historically um, that the biggest, um, <clears throat> the biggest, the biggest medical um, detractor of um, of effectiveness for our service members when they get into theater is disease, non-battle injury, um, and we also know that it is much better um, medical practice to prevent. Um, those issues versus actually treating them after they've actually occurred. And so individual medical readiness is really preventative medicine for our soldiers um, to try to reduce those disease non-battle injuries for when they get into that severe austere environment. We know that, that there are going to be casualties um, at war and we know to a certain extent because we're in a disease non, well, excuse me, because we're in an austere environment, um, there's going to be increased risk for those disease non-battle injuries. But having soldiers be fully medically ready is one of the best things that soldiers, leaders, commanders can do to prepare those soldiers to operate in an, in an austere environment and to try to reduce or mitigate the risk of those disease non-battle injuries. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much everyone uh, for their definitions and rationale for why we need to be a medically ready fighting force. Uh, I, I do know we have some slides and we have some questions as well. Uh, and I do know that uh, Colonel Dentiman, you're going to be the one kind of guiding the discussion today. So let me know when you're ready and we could go ahead and share uh, those slides with you. Sure. Why don't we go ahead and get started? I think what we were going to start out with was to talk a little bit about kind of what are the current medical readiness goals um, for the Army uh, as it currently stands. And, and we can talk a little bit about kind of where we see that heading. Um, but Lieutenant Colonel Stevens and I were both going to handle that. Um, if you could bring up the, uh, the medical readiness goals slide, um, I think that would be a good place to kind of start our discussion. Okay. Is it this one? Uh, to be the next one, I believe. There we go. Oh, one more. Sorry. One more. It's all right. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Lieutenant Colonel Stevens, you want to go ahead and start the discussion? Sure. Uh, again, currently the uh, individual medical readiness goal is 85%, uh, which is the uh, MRC 1 and 2 for reporting purposes in accordance with the IMR DOTI 6025.19. Um, uh, in accordance with AR 40-502, the med medical readiness goal is 90%, which is uh, in line with the pending um, revision of the IMR DOTI. And the DOD goals... Um, is less than 5% for non-deployable soldiers. All right. And so the, the important things I think to, to take away from here are that the, the Army has steadily been increasing their medical readiness goals over the um, past couple of years. Um, and so 90% uh, medically ready, as, as Lieutenant Colonel Stevens uh, mentioned, a combination of our MRC-1 fully medically ready uh, and then MRC-2 uh, partially medically ready um, those, uh, in, that goal uh, has progressively increased, uh, as, it, as she mentioned, currently 85%, but um, we anticipate that will be moving um, at a, from a DOD perspective up to 90% here um, very shortly. So the Army has already had that, that goal, um, although the, the DOD is, is, uh, is um, going to be matching it here very shortly. Um, the, uh, when we talk about um, medically, those medical readiness categories, um, you know, medically ready MRC1, fully medically ready is, is fairly self-explanatory. Essentially means that, that uh, when you pull up your IMR, um, that, that all of you, you're entirely green. You've had your, your, your annual, all your annual checkups, you have all your immunizations, you have DNA on file, um, you know, uh, and um, when we move into partially medically ready, those are where you may have uh, you know, a couple of those items that just need to be uh, um, just need to be corrected. Uh, maybe you need to um, still have a lab drawn, or you're missing an immunization, or 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 something like that. 
um, but it is not judged to be impacting um, your ability to deploy as well. And the idea being that that individual, um, if they're MRC2, uh, if they have one of those, those small items um, that needs to be corrected, that by the time they get to SRP um, to deploy, those things can be corrected kind of on their way out. They're relatively minor. Um, now, the, so, so the MRC1 and MRC2 goal, as we mentioned, um, currently 85%, um, according to the current DOTI. Army's, however, is 90%. Um, and then uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens mentioned that non-deployable number uh, uh, being less than 5%. It's important to recognize that um, that's the total non-deployable number. Um, so that's not medically non-deployable. That is the total non-deployable. And so non-deployable is a combination of both administratively being non-deployable as well as medically non-deployable. Um, and so uh, of those, uh, you know, different percentages, uh, the largest percentages is medically non-deployable um, when you compare it to administrative non-deployability. And so um, for the, the Army, and we can talk a little bit here in, in, the, in the, the next couple slides in terms of kind of where the Army currently stands, um, there's about 60 uh, of the, the non-deployable soldiers, about 60 to 65 percent of those are medically non-deployable um, versus being non-deployable for some other reason. Um, so and then as we kind of mentioned, uh, the uh, while medical readiness doesn't equal non-deployability or deployability, um, they're they are um, somewhat aligned and, and they're they're going to be progressively moving to be um, more aligned in the future. Uh, and again, we don't want to equate medically ready to be to, to deployability because there are other factors that come into play there. Um, but as much as possible, um, we want commanders to be able to look at what the medical readiness of their force is and be able to make um, good estimations about the deployability um, of those service members. Okay, so kind of, I guess this could kind of per, per, this can kind of connect to the first question that essentially we have regarding medical readiness. And that first question for the panel is, uh, so what are the medical readiness goals for the Army? And I think you've kind of briefed on that information, sir, but is there a certain hard number that uh, overall that we're trying to hit? Yeah, I think it would say that, that that medical readiness goal, as we mentioned, is that is 90% at this point, which is a combination of the MRC1 and MRC2. Um, and then the, uh, again, it's not a medical readiness goal, um, but deployability um, uh, we want to have that less than less non-deployability. We want to have that less than five percent. As I mentioned, that's a combination of both admin as well as medically non-deployable. Now, we do not within G37 medical readiness. We don't have oversight on deployability. Um, but as I mentioned, a lot of what we do impacts medical readiness um, and the policy uh, behind medical readiness, and that, in many cases, drives deployability determinations. Um, and so it's an it's an it's a, an indirect effect versus a, a direct effect from medical readiness. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Uh, and that was a good first question. So would you like to move on, sir? Sure, sure. Why don't we move on? Okay. What's the next thing that you'd like to do? This one. Uh, well, I think what we would like to do is go back to kind of where we currently stand. And so let's go. The, let's go to this slide here. Total force medical readiness. Okay. Um, and, uh, and I think we had talked a little bit uh, about, um, or one of the things that we were going to discuss was, um, you know, the, the impact of kind of operating in the COVID environment and what's that done to the Army's medical readiness. Um, you know, this is, this is a, uh, what we call the total force medical readiness slide. And um, in, the, in the upper right, upper right portion of the slide, um, you'll see uh, deployability information um, which we uh, get from from G1, and that kind of illustrates what I was what I was uh, discussing in terms of kind of how the medical non deployability um, is kind of the larger percentage of the total non deployability number. Um, but what we focus on is really the the, the bottom portion there, um, and you can see the level of detail uh, and the breakdown in terms of of. Uh, what we look at and what um, Army senior leaders and, and Department of Defense senior leaders um, see uh, as it relates to, to medical readiness. And this is data that can be pulled on a, on a daily basis. In this case, what we're seeing is kind of a monthly roll-up 
So, so it's somewhat of a snapshot in time. Um, uh, also on this slide, uh, it reflects kind of um, where the current uh, goals are and where the, the Army currently stands. Um, and so what's, you know, kind of notable about this slide, uh, which reflects data from, from September, this kind of early September timeframe, um, is that you'll see, as we mentioned, the Army's medically readiness uh, goals, uh, according to the DOTI, would be um, greater than 85%. According to the, the Army's um, internal regulations, it should be greater than 90%. Well, we currently stand uh, around, you know, 83 and change, or a little bit closer to 84%, but, but um, somewhere around 83 and change. And that um, has fluctuated a little bit. Uh, but, you know, that's a reflection of, of operating in the COVID environment. Um, and when you, when you dive in a little bit deeper to try to determine, um, you know, wh what's, what is driving that impact, um, what you find is that it's primarily uh, an increase in our MRC4 category, uh, which are those individuals who are essentially missing a, uh, an annual dental exam. Um, or have uh, an expired uh, periodic health assessment. Now, those are those are our um, uh, requirements that um, previously had required uh, in-person uh, encounters. So the the soldier actually had to go to the dental clinic, and frankly, for dental, the soldier still has to go to the dental clinic, um, and they so they have to have an encounter uh, with the dentist to actually do an exam, um, and uh, and and bring them all, or kind of meet that that annual requirement. Um, and that's something that that still is required. But um, with regards to the periodic health assessment, um, you know, COVID has been a bit of a, of a double-edged sword in the sense that, um, yes, it has certainly impacted um, readiness services uh, throughout the military. Um, but it also has kind of driven innovation um, in ways that we maybe wouldn't have envisioned um, kind of pre-pandemic, uh, and we've kind of discovered that, you know, there are opportunities for utilizing um, alternative methods to completing some of these requirements, um, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in the, in the future, but one of those would be um, something like virtual encounters, so using virtual PHAs to try to meet that requirement, and so uh, our uh, medical providers, the, the, the regional health commands, as well as the uh, individual uh, MTFs have, have really been great about um, being innovative in their approach to try to uh, tackling some of these issues um, to try to, to, to meet that, that need and then kind of tackle some of the backlog. Um, and so the, the, the reason that we see that the, um, that our, the Army's medical readiness and kind of the, the COVID environment um, has uh, dropped a bit um, is really driven by that MRC4 category, which has essentially doubled from where it had been pre pre pandemic in terms of the percentage. Um, now, as the COVID, as we learn to operate in a COVID environment, as as the MTFs are able to kind of mitigate some of the impact of COVID, and and uh, and we you know become more vigilant about kind of our our, uh, uh, our our strategies to protect our service members and protect our our, our MTFs. Um, our, our dental colleagues um, and our, our readiness um, providers um, have really kind of stepped up to the plate. And so um, our dental providers are actually, per, are actually conducting uh, more dental exams now uh, on the order of, a, of several hundred um, uh, per day, more than they had been doing pre-pandemic to try to tackle that backlog. Uh, likewise, um, regarding the, the PHAs, the PHA workload has also significantly increased as well. Again, more than had it actually been pre-pandemic. And we're going to need that to continue to order in order to kind of tackle this backlog. Um, but in terms of, of kind of where we currently stand, it, it does seem like we've maybe hit a, a plateau in terms of uh, um, the, the, the rates of our, of our MRC4 and, and um, we, we are cautiously optimistic. We're going to start seeing those start to come, down, come back down here shortly. Um, the other thing I would just point out in terms of uh, the other category we haven't spent much, spent much time talking about is our MRC3 category. Um, and MRC3 um, is really that category where we say those individuals are not medically ready. And so um, those, uh, that, that, that uh, category 
um, can reflect individuals who uh, have a, uh, a permanent profile that is putting them, uh, referring, it's requiring them to be referred to a, a medical board. Um, the soldiers that are pregnant are gonna fall into that category. <clears throat> soldiers that have an, a, an extended uh, temporary profile can fall into that category as well. And there are certain service members within there that, that can be deemed deployable, but still that's essentially considered to be a not medically ready category. Um, and interestingly, what we have seen is that during the pandemic, um, that MRC three category actually decreased a bit. Um, and uh, our thought on that is that there are a couple things that were going on in the during the pandemic. Um, number one, uh, a lot of the um, uh, elective kind of procedures um, and things that might actually drive uh, an extended profile, um, perhaps kind of a post-operative recovery profile, that sort of thing. A lot of those elective procedures were put on hold or were delayed. Um, and so we saw a decrease in the number of service members who had ex actually extended profiles. Um, uh, and so the the lack of, or the, the decrease in the elective procedures is one potential um, component of that. The other thing was that a lot of the kind of the collective training, a lot of the, the heavy physical training also um, was kind of put on hold for a period of time. Uh, again, again, until we could kind of control the environment a bit, a bit, um, uh, a bit better than what had it, had it been earlier in the spring. And so as a result of that, we actually saw our MRC3 uh, category drop a bit. Um, now it is starting to kind of slightly come back up again. And we think, again, that's a reflection of the fact that we have um, uh, more kind of collective training, more physical training that's occurring, as well as the fact that um, contained within that category is our, our DRC or dental readiness category three. And those individuals actually require um, uh, some dental work. Um, and the concern in that category is that you have service members um, who may require a procedure that generates aerosols. And because of that aerosol generation <clears throat> and because of the COVID environment, um, that requires some, some strategies, um, sometimes facility modifications, uh, sometimes it's PPE that's required, um, but it, it is a, a more um, extensive uh, process to tackle those dental readiness three uh, service members um, than, uh, than the other categories. And so those are starting to creep up as well. Uh, and, and so we might see those starting to play a more um, substantial role uh, as time goes by. Mr. Tisson, if you could go to the, the next slide. The, the next slide really just kind of gives a, a visual representation um, of what I was just mentioning. Um, this just this slide just really reflects the, the MRC Go category, as I mentioned, that's the, the MRC one and two combined. Um, it's broken out by the, uh, the, the component. So we have both the total, we have the total force and then we have the three components reflected there. Um, and, uh, and so you can see kind of um, when the pandemic uh, really kind of hit the United States in kind of the spring of, of uh, spring earlier this year, um, there was a period of time where, where uh, we were able to kind of sustain our medical readiness really because we had been doing a pretty decent job pre-pandemic. Um, and then when those readiness services kind of uh, uh, became more difficult to access, uh, those medical readiness um, uh, MMRC Go uh, numbers have been, have been dropping down. Um, and you do note that there is that distinction between the different components with our reserve components. In particular, the US, uh, USAR, the reserve um, service members, uh, having more of a, a precipitous drop um, than, the, uh, than the guard and the, the active force. Um, and so that is uh, something that requires our attention to try to help, help those folks um, uh, kind of climb back to, to where they need to be. So I've been speaking a lot right now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking right now, and I want to uh, open it up to Lieutenant Colonel Stevens, Lieutenant Colonel Andreas. Um, did I did I miss anything? Is there anything you guys want to highlight as it relates to um, uh, medical readiness of the force uh, in, in the COVID environment? Uh, no, sir. You were you were you were spot on. Okay. Okay. I Okay. I do have a question. That so, I can... uh, Go I'll ahead, sir. Back. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Tucson, if you'll, if you'll post that, that what is the army doing to mitigate uh, mm -hmm. or reverse the effects of uh, COVID on MR? Uh, that's one that we wanted to answer for, for the audience. And 
I'll say that, you know, first and foremost, obviously across the army, uh, we're attempt, um, because anytime a soldier uh, contracts, um, uh, the COVID-19 virus, then, uh, you know, their medical readiness, uh, is, uh, it drops for that period of time until they recover. And then they could potentially have, um, you know, future impacts due to the virus. So tr trying to reduce um, the spread by uh, following uh, CDC guidance. Um, and, and then using the uh, restriction of movement protocols uh, prior to moving soldiers. So for instance, um, uh, PCSing them to a new duty station or sending them to schools. Uh, and then also um, TRADOC has focused uh, at the um, initial entry training um, locations to do a restriction movement, uh, basically a, a quarantine period at the be beginning to make sure that all the soldiers that are, are going to go into that training cycle uh, or the trainees uh, in that training cycle are, are healthy um, and ready to go. Uh, and then also attempting to go virtual wherever possible uh, to reduce face-to-face -face, uh, contact or in interactions between um, folks. Um, a good example of, of, of that is um, for us in MR is doing uh, virtual PHAs and doctor's appointments, which has proven to be next have significant protocols in place to protect those needing access to their facilities for their uh, IMR services, individual PHA, my periodical health uh, assessment this year uh, virtu well, virtually over the phone with my provider after I did my online um, questionnaire uh, and, and that went well. Um, and then uh, for some of my PHA things, I had to go to an MTF, military uh, treatment facility for Belvoir. Um, I, I did that yesterday uh, for immunizations. Uh, I felt safe with the environment. Um, also yesterday, um, I went to the dental clinic and got my annual exam uh, and, and cleaning. So um, there's protocols in place at our, um, at our, uh, that allow us to have access, but uh, when, when, when access faith that face to face access isn't required, then we're uh, we're doing that virtually. Um, so, so I'll let um, I'll let uh, Colonel Dentiman if he wants to to speak about Viper, Viper Clinic, or, or I can do that. No, I'm happy to talk about it. So um, the when we talk about, you know, what kind of things have we done to to try to mitigate um, the impact uh, of COVID? Um, okay, well, um, I'll, I'll uh, mention Viper Clinic. So Viper Clinic uh, was stood up down at, um, at Joint Base San Antonio. Uh, basically, that's a, a location where they have um, providers who are able to um, execute um, virtual PHAs um, for soldiers that don't have uh, ready access to IMR services, either they're re remote or they're MTF um, due to the COVID environment in their area and things like that. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Oh boy, I think we may have a big um, we may have a big la uh, lag here. So I yeah. apologize. <laughs> All right, Mr. Tucson is um, is he maybe having some issues? If so, well, we can. No, no issues here. No issues here. We may have a little bit of a lag. On, we may have uh, a little bit of a lag in the audio. But to the next question, we're good if, to go. If there's okay, let's jump into the next. Let's jump into the next question, team. So the next question is, uh, what is the Army on medical readiness? Okay, so um, the I think as we mentioned, one of the things that we're talking we've been talking oh, about here or trying to address is the um, the technology at its finest, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is 
uh, virtual access to, to medical care uh, where appropriate. And so um, one of those is the, is the Viper Clinic. Um, the, uh, the Viper Clinic um, is a, a, a virtual kind of readiness clinic um, that is run out of San Antonio, okay. um, but has so the Colonel ability Dindy, to I mean, do you want to provide. move on? Yeah. Oh, boy. <clears throat> hmm. um, has the ability to continue to, has the ability to provide medical services, medical readiness services um, to, uh, uh, you know, locations that are remote from, from BAMC. Um, and it can be used to supplement um, MTF services. It can be used to um, uh, provide support to a certain extent to uh, a reserve and guard component service members. Um, and, uh, and that can actually include services um, for, for places that are overseas as well. Um, in addition to providing things like a, a, a PHA, um, to a certain extent, they can um, provide profile reviews um, they can, uh, in some cases, actually, uh, as they bring on more credential providers, they will be able to actually uh, provide second signatures for profiles that, that uh, require a second signature and or modify profile um, that perhaps maybe needs to be modified uh, to account, for example, the, for the, the, um, the, the implementation of the ACFT. So uh, um, it's a, it's a, a wonderful um, resource that is getting uh, more and more attention, rightfully so, uh, and more resources. Um, and so we want to, to tout that as a, as a service to explore um, if you're struggling to kind of meet some of the, the demands of, of, um, uh, of the, uh, in, within your readiness clinic. Um, it is something that does require coordination with the, the Viper Clinic, uh, and they do require a, uh, you know, a support agreement to be in place. Um, so it's not something that can be turned on immediately, um, but it is a great resource to explore to see whether or not they can actually uh, provide you some support um, to try to boost up your your services there um, at your your local MTF, uh, or if you're a, a commander, uh, whether or not that might be a, a resource that you can take advantage of um, uh, as as it as it relates to uh, um, um, you know tackling some of those medical readiness uh, issues. Uh, another um, uh, thing that I want to mention that is a kind of a, a late breaking and I think is going to be kind of a, it will be a positive, um, will have a positive impact for, for medical readiness, um, especially kind of in this COVID environment, um, is uh, related to our, our medical readiness um, IT systems. And so um, for a couple of years now, um, for a variety of reasons, um, the only way that service members have been able to access um, the uh, MedPro system or the MOD system, which is what is required for them to actually go in and, for example, do part one of the PHA, um, has been to, to get access from a military um, computer or at least a computer on a military network. Um, and that uh, has actually coming up on about three years in terms of, of how long uh, that limitation has been into effect. And obviously, in a in a COVID environment, if if you're um, you know isolating at home, or if you're you're trying to limit uh, service members kind of coming together collectively in one location, having the ability to actually access that system uh, from home or or remotely um, can be uh, really value added. And so, um, one of the things that that we think will be we're, we're in the process of testing it right now, um, but we're we're cautiously optimistic is that. Uh, we think we have established basically a, a, a virtual portal um, that can be accessed from uh, a computer that's on a civilian network um, with a CAC reader um, that the service member can then uh, go into that virtual portal and then access mods through that virtual portal. So it is not direct access to mods from a personal computer. It requires the individual to go ahead and, and gain access to the virtual portal but once they gain that access, it gives them uh, the ability to go into mods then uh, and complete, for example, their part one of their PHA uh, or any other functions that uh, an individual would need to complete um, or, you know, and allow them to kind of monitor their medical readiness um, mm -hmm. from home or from a, a non-military network computer. Um, and so that is something that we know um, the service has been clamoring for and, and rightfully so. 
um, and it will not. Um, this is a is really viewed as, from our perspective, as kind of a bridge strategy, something that that will uh, kind of uh, again hopefully improve access, um, especially for our Compo two and three soldiers who maybe really don't have have very limited access to a, a military network computer. Um, uh, but it won't stop us from pushing forward to try to reestablish that that direct access um, uh, to try to to not have to go into that virtual environment. Um, but we think um, you know getting that that access um, established early, um, even if it has to require this kind of additional step to go into that virtual environment, is still a a, a value added um, uh, thing. And and so it's being it's being tested right now. But we don't have any indications that that is not going to work at this point. So um, I'm going to knock on some wood, and and hopefully that that will be coming out to the services um, or to the, the the different components in the army here um, shortly in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, thank you. So do you want to? What slide would you like, guys, like to move on to next? Uh, let's let's see here. Uh, why don't we go to, um, uh, we'll talk about kind of upcoming uh, policy changes. Uh, Mr. Toussaint, there is a uh, multicolored slide with the current MRC system, that one right there. There we go. Yeah. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens, you want to uh, talk about this? Yes. Um, in regards to uh, the policies um, uh, coming into effect, the revisions of uh, DOTI, uh, 1332.45, uh, which is the retention of non-deployable service members, as well as DOTI, uh, as we mentioned earl earlier, DOTI uh, 6025.19, which is the uh, individual medical readiness DOTI, and DOTI uh, 6490.07, which is the duty limiting medical conditions DOTI, um, as well as the 29 April 2020 set death memo on military service pre-deployment and um, we um, we will be begin revising AR 40-501, um, AR 40-502, as well as our DA PAM 40-502 to align with these uh, Army regulations and uh, medical readiness systems of record. Um, again, with the uh, DOD goals of less than 5% uh, and our improved uh, reporting systems. We will also be uh, working, as you know, um, with the new implementation of the ACFT uh, as one of October 2020, OTSG will um, be working on a new uh, DA form 3349, which is for the physical profile that allows providers to annotate functional activities and limitations. Uh, so we must ensure that um, the permit profiles are updated in e-profile. As well, um, as far as other policies, uh, we are working with um, uh, trying to implement the new sickle cell uh, trait screening. I'll, I'll let uh, Colonel Andreas brief on that a little later, but the Army is planning to implement this uh, universal screening for sickle cell trait um, uh, screening. As well as we're also, as far as um, policy goes and training, uh, we're working um, in developing a um, JKO online course, uh, Writing Quality Profiles. Uh, it's a training course with uh, Medical Centers of uh, Medical Center of Excellence, which is MedCo. The anticipated um, course on state is going to be late fourth quarter, um, but that's coming along uh, well. And then, as Colonel Dentiman mentioned, uh, we are working with our mod system. Uh, uh, IT, uh, IT change requests and prior to prioritization. Um, of our systems to come in line with uh, the DOTIs. Uh, previously, we did um, have a um, uh, MRC um, system um, review, uh, and there was uh, back in September of 2019, we had a um, OPT, and we were looking to, with the revisions of these DOTIs, um, moving from um, four categories uh, for our medical readiness. Um, categories uh, down to three. So currently, you know, we have the four, which is MRC one, which is medically ready. Uh, MRC two, which is now currently partially medically ready. And then MRC three being medically, but not ready. So those are your non-deployable soldiers. And then MRC four was our medically indeterminate. 
So uh, currently we are proposing to go to three categories upon the publishing of the DOTI, uh, IMR DOTI, going from deployable to deployable with IMR deficits uh, and non-deployable. So, we have a lag there. Okay, so with those three categories, deployable will be uh, a soldier has no medical deficiencies. Uh, the deployable with IMR deficits, uh, those will include your PHAs, your immunizations, your HIV, your dental, uh, equip your dental and your equipment. And the deployable with limitations will be your temp profiles, um, as well as some of your per per permanent profiles. And then your non-deployable population will be um, your temp profiles greater than 90 days uh, with complex conditions uh, to include pregnancy, and then your board, your MARTUs, and your MEBs and your PEBs. So currently, that's what we have in um, coming uh, down the pipe with um, policy changes. All right, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, no, um, that's great. I, 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 this slide that you see in front of you, I think um, there's a, a decent amount going on. But the important thing to kind of recognize here is that um, you know the the top system um, really uh, gets kind of complicated. And so uh, if you're, you know, a a, a, a commander, um, you know, and you have a service member who is uh, MRC three. Well, you have the ability to kind of make a determination, and and some of those service members might be deployable. Some of them may not be. Your MRC four, you don't really know, you know, what to do about them. They they you know have requirements that are needed um, to be to be to have the individual be ready to deploy. So the thought um, uh, really with the the proposed system um, that aligns with the IMR DOTI is really let let's let's try to align medical readiness. Um, with with deployability. Um, again, we don't want it to, to equate with deployability, but we want it to align um, so that when that commander or that service member um, looks up their medical readiness, um, they can make a, a pretty quick judgment based on, on where they stand uh, about whether that service member um, is, is potentially useful um, uh, for for an upcoming deployment or, or training or, or whatever that case uh, may be. And it, it makes it pretty explicit in terms of what service member, what population is non-deployable. And those are really those individuals who have a, a condition uh, or something going on with them um, that is gonna require prolonged uh, either um, recovery uh, or prolonged um, uh, um, um, processing in order for that for that uh, that that condition to either be resolved or dispositioned whatever the case may be um, and and really it reflects that that just about every other medical condition um, you know there is the the possibility that, that individual can be deployed um, if the right things are taken care of whether it's you know uh, getting the the labs taken care of at an SRP site or whether they have a uh, a profile such that the condition is uh, is one that will be resolved, um, you know, just uh, within a, a, a brief period of time. Um, and so, uh, like I said, th this is going to be upcoming uh, policy revision for us, and um, and is really driven um, by the publication of the the DOTIs that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens was talking about. Um, the the ACFT is another uh, one that is kind of um, currently ongoing, and so the the most recent uh, ATP publication and, and guidance um, as it relates to ACFT implementation um, is also going to drive uh, a lot of the revisions that that come out of our section as it relates to the uh, profile um, and uh, and whether or not um, the ACFT or what conditions in particular uh, or not conditions, but what activities within the ACFT. Um, you know, are required uh, uh, for for a service member to be able to perform, um, and then if they can't perform those activities, um, what what happens as it relates to uh, a, a medical board referral? Um, and so those are, are kind of upcoming um, uh, policy revisions and decisions that are going to be um, uh, required here in the the relatively short term, 
Although obviously we all understand that that policy revisions are are not something that happen um, overnight, and so um, it, it's it's something that we've been given a lot of thought of, um, but it's going to take some time to actually um, uh, uh, implement uh, for the services. All right. Well, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so, what what would you like to go into next? Um, let's see here. I think. I think what we were going to talk about um, was we talked about what's the most uh, what's the what has the biggest impact in terms of um, driving uh, individual medical readiness. And I think Lieutenant Colonel Andreas was going to talk about that one. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'll cover that. So uh, first, uh, I, I just want to say this because we didn't cover uh, this in our introductions, but you'll see on the slides uh, in several places that it talks about total force. And so we are a total force policy army, and we are also a total force policy division in uh, G37 medical readiness because Colonel Dentiman is an active component, Compo 1 officer. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stevens is a uh, Compo 3 U.S. Army Reserve uh, AGR officer, uh, and I am a uh, Compo 2 Army National Guard uh, AGR officer. So <laughs> any of our viewers out there who <clears throat> are Compo 2 or Compo 3, um, who have any consider, uh, concerns about um, uh, equities and um, uh, in the policy, you can uh, rest assured that this is a total force uh, division and uh, everybody's getting uh, considered when we write these policies. Okay, so um, the question is, uh, what is the most impactful on the building of individual soldier uh, um, readiness uh, or uh, medical readiness? And so I, I would say there's two things. Uh, one, there's a soldier and two, there's the commander. So soldiers have to take responsibility of their individual medical readiness. Um, they need to know their IMR status. Uh, when they will go amber uh, at 12 months um, for the annual requirements and when they'll go red, uh, at 15 months. So uh, they have 12 months of um, uh, that they're captured under their um, PHAs and dental uh, uh, assessments and exams. Uh, and at 12 months, it goes amber saying, hey, you need to do this again. It's an annual requirement. Uh, they have a 90 day uh, window to, to um, recapture uh, their assessments and exams. And then at that 90 day mark, at the 15 month mark, they go red. So they go on the red list and everybody's uh, looking at to see why uh, they haven't been reassessed to make sure that they are uh, healthy and strong and ready for deployment. So they need to know that. They need to know what their dates are. It's kind of like their army birthday. Uh, they need to know when they're going to celebrate going back to uh, their provider and their dentist to get uh, another look. Uh, they need to know their PCM, their pri primary care manager, um, and their primary care manager nurse and uh, use an online system to communicate with them and set up appointments. Uh, and then they also need to have familiarity with the facilities that they have access to for IMR, their, their clinics or MTFs and all that uh, other things. The familiarity uh, tends to help them being more comfortable with reaching out for appointments and, um, and seeking that care. Uh, so just like they're, they're responsible for, uh, you know, they're individually responsible for passing their PT test and being prepared for their PT test, they need to do the same uh, for their IMR. Uh, and then the second part is the commanders. The commanders staying focused on their soldiers' medical readiness. I just finished battalion command in May, uh, and that was part of my responsibility is um, continually looking at uh, where our soldiers, where my soldiers were with their medical readiness, who was going to uh, become amber and who was going to become red, and getting them appointments um, and, and following up and sharing that uh, all their paperwork came back and got in the systems of record. So uh, commanders, they need to utilize the commander's portal uh, that we provided for them and take the training so they're, they're uh, comfortable and familiar with that portal. Um, they need to know their soldier's IMR status and, and track when they need to attend PHAs and uh, doctor's appointments and dental appoint, uh, appointments and all that other stuff. Um, uh, because commanders need to remember this one thing. Uh, and, and I had this as one of my mantras as, as a commander is you can't deploy a vacancy. And what I mean by that is if the soldier is not medically ready, uh, they're not getting on that plane. They're not getting on that bus to go deploy uh, with the rest of the unit. So therefore, that soldier gets pulled aside and now you have a vacancy going forward. 
And uh, when you go forward uh, into a deployed environment to do a mission, uh, it's hard to do it with a, a bunch of vacancies. And those vacancies can be mitigated just by paying close attention to the medical readiness. Um, it, the commander soldiers can be the best trained and the best equipped uh, soldier, even in the unit. Uh, but if they're not signed off by the medical staff um, as individually medically ready, uh, then their position on the deployment roster is vacant. <clears throat> so those two things are, are to me, the most impactful is the soldier paying attention, the commander paying attention, them working as a team um, to make sure all the requirements for medical readiness are met. And that's on top of training and that's on top of some other things. Because uh, like I said, uh, if they spend all their time out in the field uh, training and none of their time in the clinics and MTFs becoming medical ready, then, then their uh, high speed training is, is all for naught. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I'm going to jump in. I, I, I totally concur with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andreas' assessment and I appreciate his perspective as a uh, as a battalion commander, um, that that is 100% absolutely correct. Um, a couple of points that I want to touch on um, is that if you are a if you are a leader of soldiers, um, if you are a, a commander or or if you are an NCO leading soldiers, um, you have to understand medical readiness. It, it is not something that can be paid lip service to. Um, and so, if you're a commander, as Lieutenant Colonel Andreas mentioned. You have to have access to that commander's portal, um, and and you have to be communicating with the um, profiling providers for your soldiers, so you can make individual deployment determinations for those individuals. Um, as I mentioned, you know earlier when I was talking, pr prevention um, is always going to be better than trying to mitigate the after effects uh, of an injury uh, or a condition that's been allowed to kind of fester, and so. In many ways, um, that uh, can can you know expand and, and apply um, to just about any condition that's going to require a profile, and that system is set up to facilitate the communication between the commander uh, and the profiling provider. And so that that a clear, efficient communication is essential to making sure that the commander is managing um, the readiness of their soldiers in cooperation with that profiling provider. Um, the other thing I want to mention is just from a, from a medical perspective, so we've talked about kind of the individual soldier and we've talked about the, the commanders as well, but from a medical perspective, the medical provider's perspective, every encounter with a soldier should be a medical readiness visit. Um, and so by that, I mean that, you know, uh, just because a service member is coming in for a, a one particular complaint, it doesn't mean that that provider can't take the opportunity to check on the IMR status of that service member, to check if they have a permanent profile, to see has the condition um, as it relates to that permanent profile, has it changed at all? Does the profile need to be modified it, or, or is, it, is, it, is it currently valid? Those are all important questions that really should be asked at every medical reading, every, every medical visit, regardless if it, if it is a, a readiness visit or not. Um, and when we when we when we can get into that mindset that every medical visit is going to actually encompass medical readiness of that service member as well, um, I think what we'll find is that it will relieve some of the burden on trying to tackle everything um, at that one you know PHA appointment or that one medical readiness visit for that service member on an annual basis. Uh, and it gets uh, our medical providers also in the mindset of what am I really here for? You, you, you are really here to actually provide a medically ready fighting force. Um, and so um, even though that, that individual might be uh, providing care for, for one particular, you know, specialty um, or, uh, you know, uh, maybe not, you know, part of the readiness clinic, uh, if we can ingrain in our medical providers that every visit needs to be a medical readiness visit, um, I think that will help us to 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 try to uh, meet some of the 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 goals that we've sent um, that we've set for the for the army moving forward in terms of medical readiness. Um, so those are those are just the two thing other two things that I I wanted to to highlight as well. And I'll close out just saying being proactive versus reactive. Uh, everything will 
will fall into place uh, as what my um, cohort, cohort, co cohorts here have, have uh, touched on, just being proactive versus reactive, and we'll get there. Okay. And it's, I really appreciate the, uh, the sharing of the slides and the information, as well as answering the questions. Um, from what I'm seeing uh, from our discussion, uh, there was a couple more slides left, but um, from what I'm seeing also, we have about 15 viewers right now, and we got up to about 30 viewers who enjoyed the conversation that we had today on medical readiness. Uh, team, is there anything else that we'd like to share as far as comments or questions uh, in closing of our discussion? Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that's coming out here shortly is our sickle cell trait screening program. And so I think um, I'd love to, to spend a little time talking about that. Um, it, it is a, obviously it's a more, you know, kind of uh, uh, um, smaller um, uh, effort, but it is one that we're pushing out um, for the whole force and, and one that, you know, most folks may be unfamiliar with, um, but I wanna, that our implementation date for that is, is coming up here quickly in the beginning of November. And if you're a medical provider, um, or even if you're in the force, we want you to be aware of this. Um, and so sickle cell trait is a, a genetic condition. Um, and, uh, and it is a, a condition um, uh, that's inherited. Um, <clears throat> those individuals who have sickle cell trait, in, in large cases, it's entirely a benign condition. Um, and the Army currently screens for sickle cell trait um, for certain MOSs in certain schools and certain jobs. And the reason for that is because um, in, in kind of uh, stressful situations under high exertion, um, those individuals can be at risk for uh, a condition, exertional condition, uh, that can actually lead to uh, permanent disability, um, injury, or, or in, in the absolute worst cases, death. And so um, the Army basically looked at this and said, you know what, um, there are service members within our ranks who um, may actually have sickle cell trait uh, and who don't know it. And we want to not only kind of mitigate the risk of, of this condition uh, amongst just for, for individual schools or just for individual MOS, as we want to do it for the, for the entire force. And so, um, so we will be implementing or the Army, I should say, will be implementing uh, universal sickle cell trait screening starting in November, um, and it will occur on a rolling basis uh, for the existing force so we can kind of complete the screening for the entire force. Uh, and then it will also occur at the same time at IET sites for new recruits as well. Um, individuals who are identified who have sickle cell trait um, will receive specialized education, um, they'll receive a, uh, uh, an ID tag, a red ID tag to, uh, to uh, uh, alert uh, those around them to, to that condition. Um, and then uh, if there is training that's occurring or if there's a um, mission occurring where there's going to be uh, concerns about high exertion, um, just special attention needs to be, uh, uh, you know, paid to those individuals or the medical providers just need to be aware uh, of that individual's condition because, as I mentioned, under the right environmental conditions, those those particular soldiers um, can have an exacerbation uh, that that can be significantly uh, can 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 hurt them significantly. Um, individuals who are identified as uh, having sickle cell trait um, are not going to be limited uh, for any duties. Um, it is not a condition that will impact sessions. Uh, promotion or um, any consideration for schools or assignments or anything like that. Uh, it, is, it is done entirely to um, improve the safety, um, safety operating environment uh, that we have for our service members um, and to give the commanders the ability to, um, to try to reduce that risk among their ranks um, if they have service members um, who have that condition. Um, so uh, hopefully uh, uh, folks in the audience have heard about this, um, uh, uh, this plan, um, and uh, if not, um, we are happy to discuss it um, in further detail, uh, but the plan is it will start um, here in, in November and continue then on, on an ongoing basis. Um, and one other thing I was going to mention about it, but I, oh, um, no, 
Oh, I, I know what it was. Sorry. <laughs> the the other uh, aspect of this, I just wanted to make clear. Um, the other services, the Air Force, the Navy, they already do universal screening. And so in this case, uh, Army is going to go ahead and align themselves, the other services and, and um, uh, go ahead and push forward with the policy of universal screening as well. And so um, this will, will ensure uniformity amongst all the services in terms of um, screening for this particular condition. All right, and I believe if, unless anyone else has any uh, other points to share, I think that would be, I guess, the conclusion of our live stream panel regarding medical readiness with uh, this awesome team that I have here. Uh, I just wanna say coming from the Office of the Surgeon General, we really appreciate you taking the time today to come and just share the wealth of knowledge, given everyone kind of like a uh, the raw numbers and the raw data showing the importance of how important uh, medical readiness is to our fighting force for mitigation of potential issues with uh, deployment and uh, just letting us be aware of uh, the different things that the Army is implementing right now to increase our fighting force across uh, all MOSs. So I just want to say thank you to the entire team for coming and talking with me today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. And everyone. Thank you. Appreciate your time. No problem. No problem. And I'll we will talk a little later. Thank you, y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. And in closing, I want to say to everyone, medical readiness is an absolute necessity across our fighting force. Uh, with a stronger, more medically ready association organization and soldiers, we can always be at the pinpoint of making sure we can uh, properly exert whatever necessary medical attention, whatever necessary fighting force, and whatever necessary strength that we need in our army. And as I say in closing every time, uh, as I say in closing every single time, uh, army medicine is army strong.